Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation. My name is Andrea Harding. I'm the Community Relations and Events Manager here at CG. Uh, if this is your first time, welcome. If you're joining us again, welcome back, and hopefully we'll see you again further at some of, a couple more of events we have coming up in the next month and a half before we hit the summer months and everyone departs on vacation. <laughs> uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. CG is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. As settlers on this land, it is important for us to reflect on the agreements and treaties that have kept this land sustainable for thousands of years, such as taking only what you need and leaving the rest for others, and doing what we can to protect the land we live on for the next generation and those to come behind us. As always, I think it's important that we acknowledge this at our events and take the time to kind of reflect on what these words mean and think about our impact on the land and how we want to leave it for those that come after us and those that come at the same time as us. So now I'd like to welcome uh, Evan Burfield, co-founder of 1776 and CEO of Union, where he works with startups around the world tackling important challenges in areas like education, health, energy, transportation, food, and financial services. Basically everything, you just work on everything. <laughs> um, he's an angel investor and venture capitalist, and his, Evan has invested in more than 40 startups with world-changing ideas from Silicon Valley to Nairobi. His book, Regulatory Hacking, a playbook for startups, was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the 10 best business books of 2018. So Evan's going to join us on stage for a talk, and then following that, he'll be joined by Aaron Schultz, CG's Managing Director and General Counsel. Aaron um, will lead a discussion, and then we'll open the, uh, uh, up to audience for audience questions. Before we do that, I would like to welcome Greg Stanford, Counsel General of the U.S. Consulate General in Toronto, to the stage to offer his remarks. CG is very proud to be able to partner um, with the Consulate on this, and we will be, uh, we look forward to doing this in the future. <laughs> Thanks everyone uh, for coming tonight. It's indeed a pleasure to be back in uh, Waterloo. I've been uh, Council General or CG uh, of the United States here for about nine months. And in my first few months uh, being here, I decided given the state of relations at the time, probably best to go on a listening tour, uh, hear from Canadians, you know, issues that were of concern to them and to see if we couldn't find common ground. One of the first places, if not the first place outside of Toronto that I actually visited was the Kitchener-Waterloo area. It was an amazing visit. In CG as well, we had an amazing discussion. And early on, uh, decided that this was really a unique place where there's this intersection of sort of tech and innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, and really, that's where I see the, the sort of relationship going. It's these emerging technologies and the impact they'll have in terms of economic activity, job creation, and all that. And when one considers just how integrated our supply chains are, our two economies, uh, I think it's extremely important that we get sort of the public policy and other aspects of it right. And so we decided early on that uh, it, was, it would be good to bring up thought leaders and others that would help us sort of have raised those conversations around such things like uh, public policy harmonization. And so that's why it, it was a great pleasure to uh, have Evan agree to be most gracious and uh, come up here and uh, engage with a number of groups. And of course, we wanted to come back out here. Uh, but of course, there are a few things I'd like to say about the incredible work of, uh, of CG. So I just flew in, uh, I shouldn't say flew in, I, I drove in from New York. I had to go do something in New York last night and didn't really get a chance to see my uh, comments, I mean my remarks uh, before. But I did want to uh, touch briefly on uh, CG's work. Uh, it's incredibly important, as I'm sure you know, living here. Uh, they work on increasing prosperity, ensuring global sustainability, addressing inequality, safeguarding human rights, and promoting a more secure world aligns with shared Canadian and American values. These core values are the basis for our individual and mutual success and enduring strong ties. So again, on behalf of the U.S. Consulate General in Toronto, I thank CG for your hospitality and welcome other partners in the region, and it gives me great pleasure to 
introduce Evan Burfield. Evan, please. Thank you so much. Um, so I have the um, excellent uh, challenge in front of us of talking all about government regulation and making it actually interesting, engaging, and exciting for you for the next 20 minutes. And then we're going to go into an in-depth conversation on the nuances and the finer points of government regulation. <clears throat> um, as uh, Andrea said, my personal background um, is as a uh, venture capitalist and an entrepreneur uh, and as somebody who has built startup incubators and programs to kind of help grow startups. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, literally thousands of startups from Africa all the way here to Canada uh, over the last uh, five, six, seven years <clears throat> and have observed a, a, an interesting number of trends about kind of what's happening in the world and how you go about building new technologies and changing the way um, our world works. Um, it is always easy to kind of forget just how much um, our lives uh, have changed in the kind of 20 years since the internet became a thing, and in particular the 10 years since this device launched. Um, I actually know exactly uh, when the iPhone launched, because I got one the like third day they were out, because it was the day that I met my now wife. <clears throat> and I was so excited uh, when I met her, and I was so nervous afterwards that I threw my phone out in the trash. And I figured it was going to be really awkward to go back into the restaurant and dig through the trash in front of this girl I just met to find my phone, so I went and bought a brand new iPhone uh, on like the third day it had been released, because that seemed less embarrassing. Um, and at the time, you could only get an iPhone if you were using AT&T, and so I always know uh, the day I met my wife, because it's the day each year that my AT&T contract starts. So that's how I remember my, not my wedding anniversary, but my anniversary of meeting her. Um, but if you think about it now, um, the amount of many of our lives, uh, like this woman right here, that is now spent with our heads down in our, in our cell phones, is immense. Um, normally, it's about half the audience so that's, um, in, in their, uh, that's, that's buried in their phones while I'm giving this presentation, so I'm, I'm impressed. But if you think about it, it's now how we access information and consume information. Um, it's how we connect up and uh, communicate and follow what's happening with our friends and our families. Um, it is how we access goods and services and order them and get them to come to us. It's how we engage with entertainment, right? I can sit there on my ride back to Toronto tonight when I'm bored and watch the latest episode of Game of Thrones from my phone right while we're driving along. These are all things that very, very recently in our lives were like mind-blowing and they now feel remarkably pedestrian. But for all of this innovation, for all these incredible things that startups have built, that venture capital has enabled, it's also worth remembering um, how really, really concentrated in some pretty narrow parts of the economy um, this innovation has been, right? So this is the list of the biggest venture-backed exits of the last 20 years, right? These are the ones that made like 1,000x returns for the people who invested them and created not just billionaires, but people worth tens of billions of dollars, right? And when you look at it and you group them together, it turns out that actually almost all of it is focused in two areas. <clears throat> Media, how we access information and how we stay connected to people. And commerce, how we buy goods and services and things. I mean, there's a little bit of gaming and some other stuff. But the vast majority of where the capital has gone to, where the entrepreneurial talent has gone to, and where the winners have been, are actually focused on innovation in how we consume. Right? They have, it has been applying the digital revolution to our lives as consumers. Which is interesting because when you were introducing me, you went through this long list of all these sectors of the economy that don't necessarily relate directly to our lives as consumers. Things like healthcare, or transportation and how we get around in cities, or how we educate our children, or how we manage our money, right? Um, very different sectors and very different industries. And in fact, all those sectors that we, we talked about when you were introducing me, right, account for about 80% of the economy. And all this stuff here is kind of in the category of what's left. And this is kind of interesting, um, because at times it can feel like the people that are building our startups for us are doing so in a really narrow, concentrated set of places and it's a really narrow, set, concentrated set of people that are doing it. And that shows at times when it can feel like 
people like this are building what they think are building solutions to what they think are the biggest problems facing the world. Um, sometimes that feels like the kind of problems you would identify if you were a 26-year-old who had recently gotten out of college and were living without your parents for the first time. Right? There was this big wave a few years ago of laundry startups. Literally, tens of millions of dollars flowing into startups that would help you get your laundry done on demand. Probably some of these guys were literally looking around thinking, I, literally, like, how do I do my laundry is the biggest problem I could imagine solving in the world today. Um, a lot of these startups are focused on things like, um, I'm kind of awkward, how do I find a date without actually having to talk to a person in real life? Right, a lot of innovation in sectors like that. Um, and that's okay, and that's not bad, um, but it's, it's really, really narrow, and it's very limited in the conception of what digital technology can do and how it can broadly change our world. Because for all of the incredible innovations our, uh, our, our bros here have, have driven, they haven't really done much for this family. If you're a single mom, raising a kid, uh, working two jobs, um, right, the kinds of issues you care about really don't involve how do I get my laundry done on demand or how do I find a date. They involve things like, I need to be able to get uh, across town to multiple jobs inexpensively and consistently and quickly, right? I care about transportation. I need to figure out how I get access to the education to enable me to advance economically and try to make sure my kids can get access to a good education so that they uh, can, can function better economically than I did uh, generationally. Um, I really, really care about healthcare, right? I need access to good quality healthcare inexpensively and conveniently, right? These are the kinds, I need, I need access to healthy food, right? That's inexpensive and that's, that's readily available and that's, um, that's going to feed my kids in the right way, right? These are the kinds of concerns um, that this family has, right? They, they just aren't the same kinds of concerns um, that those 25-year-old Stanford grads in the Valley are obsessing and focused over every day. So the good news is this era, this past 20 years that we've come through in which we have had a tremendous amount of capital and talent and energy and thought and creativity flow into a quite narrow part of our economy right, in which a very specific set of people in a very narrow set of places have been able to sort of define uh, what gets built and how it gets built with digital technologies is, is, is come to an end. When I, and when I wrote the book, um, and I first started putting this presentation together uh, a year, a year and a half ago, I would say that it was coming to an end and we were entering a new era. And I think at this point, we can really fully say that that era has ended and that we really are now into this new era. And if you look at where most of the new startup activity is coming from, and you look at where the capital is flowing, and you even just track the headlines, all of a sudden now, we're looking at a very different kind of startup. We're looking at startups that are trying to figure out, hmm, how do we apply digital technologies to clinical workflows in a healthcare setting? How do we apply digital technologies to, um, to how we actually improve education for our kids? How do we figure out how to change the way we get around our cities in different and creative ways. Um, and this is interesting <clears throat> because it's driven by a number of trends, which I'm going to talk about, and it has a number of implications about how we go about um, building startups and innovating and how we think about this from an invest investment lens. So I'm going to kind of talk about um, five big mega trends that I think is driving this and why I believe that the next 20 years <clears throat> of innovation, the next 20 years that are gonna change the way our lives um, are lived, are just going to look fundamentally different. Why it is going to be about innovation in very complex and highly regulated sectors and why collaboration with government is suddenly going to become a really hot thing to understand how to do again. So the first trend is, oh, yes, okay. So the first trend which we talked about is that a lot of what we've seen over the last 20 years has been driven by the fact that um, who is building our startups and where they're building it is defining an awful lot about what problems they're solving and how they're going about building it. And what's interesting is that where people are building startups and then implicitly who is getting to build them is actually changing. And it's changing so much faster than most people realize. And it's kind of easy, I think, to feel that in a place like Waterloo or, or the broader Ontario area where you, you obviously have this sort of growing, vibrant startup ecosystem and you can see new startups getting founded every day and watch them grow and all of that. But what's interesting to me 
<clears throat> is that I used to sort of say, you know, you can see this happening in almost every city around the world, right? Almost any place in which you have a concentration of well-educated young people with an internet connection, you're starting to see startup ecosystems form. You're starting to see um, this kind of innovation happen. And then I, uh, I went a few years ago and visited um, Harare, Zimbabwe on another State Department trip like this. And I don't know exactly what I was expecting, but I think the sort of media lens of Zimbabwe is sort of the archetypal, archetypal failed state. You have at least officially 80% unemployment, you have uh, sort of economic collapse, you have uh, massive corruption. And what's nuts to me is I showed up in Harare and like the first day I was there, I was meeting um, fascinating startups in incubators and accelerators that were raising angel money and venture capital that were using all of the same tools that one of my startups that I was working with in Washington, D.C. or New York would be, or the same tools that the startups right here in Waterloo are using. And they were reading the same blogs, but they weren't solving the same problems. Right? Their issues weren't, how do I get my laundry done? Their issues were like, wow, I don't trust my banking system at all because they fail all the time, so I need to figure out how to create new apps to allow me to securely store and transfer my money. Right? They were creating things that said, wow, right? uh, I'm not trying to figure out how to like, teleconference with my doctor so it's a little bit more convenient. I need to actually just figure out how to get access to medical expertise, period, wherever it is in the world. And that was when it clicked to me where I, where I realized that in fact, truly every place in the world at this point where you have a concentration of young people and you have access to the internet is now fully and in real time engaged in this global startup ecosystem and innovation economy. When I was studying economics as an undergrad, we, we explored this idea a ton of, tech, of the rate of techno technological transfer. Right? This is why we have such divergence between standard of livings around the world is because the rate of technological transfer is slow. I don't think that holds, in, holds true anymore. I think when you now go to all of these places, the rate of technological transfer in almost every part of the world is effectively instantaneous. And I think we're just starting to see and understand the full implications of that. And so to put a little bit of a, a direct example around this, <clears throat> this startup right here, Twiga, is one of my very favorite startups to talk about. Um, and they're based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, they're one of my favorite startups to talk about because it's an absolutely phenomenal, inspiring team. They're solving an incredible problem that's a, an archetypal example of what I'm talking about here. Um, and also because they're now the single largest investment in my venture portfolio. So I'm really hoping they end up funding my entire retirement here in a few years. So I'm, I'm rooting for them every day. Um, and Twiga's interesting. So Twiga uh, is solving the problem of food uh, inflation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and their origin story was that one of the co-founders uh, was, was literally studying this at Oxford. <clears throat> and they were on the ground in Africa and they were studying why is the price of food rising so rapidly um, in most African countries. And to, to sort of give you context on this, if you were to go buy a banana from a mamamboga, which is like an informal street vendor near your office or near your house in Nairobi, um, you would probably pay about as much for that banana <clears throat> as uh, you would if you walked into a Whole Foods uh, in downtown Washington, D.C., despite the fact that that banana at that mamamboga was grown probably 200 miles away on the Ugandan-Kenyan border, uh, and the banana in Washington, D.C., I don't know where it was grown, but someplace far away and probably flew in an airplane and went through this whole journey to get there. Um, and now, for uh, most African cities like this, if you're a middle-class African, you're spending about 50% of your income on food, um, just feeding your family. Um, so this is a giant issue, right? It's, it's the equivalent in Africa of like healthcare spending in the U.S., where it just keeps rising and rising and it's crowding at other forms of spending. And <clears throat> Before uh, Grant, the co-founder, kind of started studying this, a lot of the view was that this is a supply problem, right? It's African farmers are inefficient, and what we need is to educate them about how to farm better. And Grant was kind of suspicious of this, and he went in, and he studied this problem, <clears throat> and he wrote his dissertation on it, and he went, actually, it's, it's not a supply problem. Like, African farmers are perfectly efficient, and they're a huge export market, and they ship tomatoes off to Italy, and they ship onions off to France, and that happens all the time. Um, it's, in fact, a supply chain problem. So to get that banana from the Ugandan border, to Nairobi, uh, a typical banana goes through about nine different middlemen. And this literally is like someone drives a banana in a truck from one market, they get it from the farm, they drive it to a market, right? Someone else comes along, pays cash, buys the bananas, drive it in another truck. This happens nine times. Over half the bananas spoil before they actually, ever actually get to market. Nowhere in there is there any cold storage or ripening. So when, when we in developed countries get our bananas, 
right? Actually, the grocery store is like shipping in huge numbers of bananas, and then they're deciding the day beforehand how many bananas they think they'll sell the next day, and they squirt a special gas on the bananas, and they ripen, poof, and then you walk into your store and you see nice, juicy uh, yellow bananas ready to go, right? Your store isn't actually trying to like have your banana arrive perfectly at the store at that moment in which it just happens to be a nice yellow ripe banana. We use technology to solve that. So Twiga decided, so Grant decided that really in fact this wasn't just a supply chain problem, it was a data and information problem. Uh, nobody really understood uh, supply side, nobody understood the demand side, nobody actually understood how to connect that together or where to put what bananas when. And so he got together with his friend, um, uh, who was the, Peter, who was the um, head of uh, Coca-Cola for, for Kenya, who knew a lot about supply chains. And they had an idea and they went and put smartphones in the hands of all these mamambogas in Nairobi. And they said, hey, instead of waking up at um, four in the morning uh, with a satchel and uh, sharing a taxi with your friends and going to the wholesale market and buying uh, as much produce as you could with cash and taking it back and opening your stall at 7 a.m. and hoping that you don't get robbed of your cash, otherwise you're out of business, we have a crazy idea. We're going to give you the smartphone. And you tell us at 6 p.m. the night before how many bananas you want. And we'll just show up at 7 a.m. and hand you a crate off of our tuk-tuk and we'll just do it all automatically through M-Pesa with mobile money, and you don't even have to worry about cash. So the crazy thing is, roll forward, Twiga now delivers 50% of all fresh fruits and vegetables and fast-moving consumer goods in Nairobi. About $100 million US a month of commerce that is going through their supply chain. Now they have giant fulfillment centers in which they go directly to farms, they negotiate long-term supply relationships, they ship in bananas, they automatically ripen just as many as they need, they get them to market. Now uh, Coca-Cola just drops their <laughs> uh, product off directly at a Twiga fulfillment center, they deliver it there. They are literally becoming the Amazon of Africa while still moving through the traditional ways and means that commerce happens in Africa, right, which is mama bogus. And as an aside, I had one of my friends go, well, why don't they just roll out grocery stores in Africa? as if this was a super obvious idea. And the answer is, well, actually, a grocery store is really only relevant if you have a car and a refrigerator and excess storage. Otherwise, you're really only going to buy as much stuff as you need for that one particular day in which you need it, and you're only going to buy as much stuff as you can actually carry. So the idea that you sort of, that supermarkets solve the problem misunderstands a whole bunch of other realities for most African families. So this is an example, right, of by <coughs> shifting where a startup is getting started and who's building it, right? you can take all these same amazing technologies and all these techniques that have allowed us to create super cool dating apps, and you can in fact solve a very, very different kind of problem. Now what's crazy, right? as Twiga is now expanding into other cities in Africa, the total size of the market in sub-Saharan Africa for high velocity commerce, basically fresh fruits and vegetables and fast moving consumer goods, batteries and Snickers bars and tissue paper and onions and tomatoes and all of this, it's about $800 billion a year in goods and services. The entire global market for online advertising, what powers Facebook and Google and all these companies, is about $300 billion a year. So if you can transform the way goods and services move across a continent, your potential for value creation and your potential for creating an incredibly valuable company is vast. So the second trend that we need to think about and again, apologies for, um, not all of my slides seem to involve Africa and fruits, but um, this is just the sequence that goes in here. Uh, but the second trend is that while we've been diversifying who gets to build startups and where they're building it, we've been also coming to the reality that sort of the low-hanging fruit has been picked. Right, so the, not that building a dating app isn't hard, but it's just not as hard as transforming clinical workflows in a healthcare setting just not as hard as figuring out how to move food uh, around a market and get it to store on time. And so an awful lot of founders, when these digital technologies, the internet and then mobile phones became a thing, understandably focused first on the relatively easier problems to go solve. They focused on things like, how do I share photos? How do I find a date? How do I get cat food to automatically arrive every week so I don't have to think about it, right? But nowadays, um, those simpler problems um, have been uh, engineered and engineered and engineered. And so if you have a, a novel new idea for a way to share a photograph, right, you're going to have to be un 
unbelievably good to be better than Instagram um, or better than Snapchat because you've now had billions and billions of dollars and unbelievably talented people f pouring over every single fine point of how to make it as appealing and cool and addictive as possible to share a photograph. Uh, if you want to transform the way in which uh, you can consume music online, that's awesome, have fun, but you're gonna have a lot of work to do. You're gonna have to be so unbelievably on your game to be better than Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon and Tidal and all the other music services that have had unbelievable amounts of capital and incredible amounts of talent focused in on them. So, as the low-hanging fruit uh, kind of comes to an end, entrepreneurs are now having to sort of start to go tackle this higher fruit. They're having to start to think through more complex problems. But most of the big interesting problems in the world, most of the ones that we hope entrepreneurs are gonna go solve, most of the really big com complex ones, are ones that look like this. Right? This is the UN development, uh, sustainable development goals as a good proxy. Well, gosh, as we look at problems like good health and innovation and infrastructure and sustainable cities and communities, quality education, clean water and sanitation, um, you know, these are problems that look very, very different. Um, they're problems that are incredibly complex, and almost every one of them uh, is incredibly regulated. And they're not incredibly regulated because government just likes to regulate. Whatever your ideology is, period, whatever system of government you happen to live under, there is no function in government in the world that doesn't regulate food supply. Go back through history, right? The Roman emperors who failed to secure the grain shipments from Egypt each year didn't stay emperors for long. Any government that's smart is going to take a very strong view in things that either present significant risks to their people or that are vital to uh, living and life. <clears throat> and that's what these things are. And so as entrepreneurs now start to dig in and address these kinds of problems, they're coming um, right up against the fact that it's not just about understanding your customer and building an amazing product and uh, figuring out a model that can scale. You also have to, in some way, navigate and figure out regulation and working with government. In some cases, that might be figuring out how to get around regulation and government. In a lot of cases, it may in fact be bringing government to the table as a partner to create the right incentives for what you're trying to do. In other cases, it may be merely pointing out, hey, if you just made this small tweak, we could help you solve the problem that you care about government and we could do it in a less expensive way. But one way or another, entrepreneurs are not going to solve the harder, more complex problems without getting very, very smart at navigating these kinds of issues. Um, and this is the antithesis of the way the sort of startup and venture community has operated for at least the last 20 years. Um, I still remember quite recently where I would encounter venture capitalists who would say very blithely, oh, we're not going to touch any startup that has any regulatory risk. We don't want to deal with those gatekeepers. Well, if that's all you're going to do, you're going to build a lot of dating apps. Um, final issue. Um, or not final, second from vital issue, is that um, the idea that we've kind of come through this, this particular period of time over the last 20 years in terms of innovation, um, one in which we had this idea of sort of permissionless innovation, that sort of startups were supposed to have almost a, a default right to try new things, um, often coined in this idea of sort of, hey, move fast and break things. Right? We don't want to stand in the way of innovation, so we're going to, we're going to make it as easy as possible. Right? It, it's not accidental. It was actually a very conscious policy choice. Um, in 1996, uh, in the United States, um, as the internet was, become, it was becoming obvious this was going to be a really big thing, uh, the U.S. Congress passed um, the uh, 1996 Telecommunications Act, and in that, <clears throat> um, they explicitly carved out a waiver for online platforms from Section 230. What that means is that Section 230 says, for everybody else, for example, if you're a newspaper, you're subject to responsibility for your actions. So if you're a newspaper, and you, if you're the Washington Post, and you publish something that is knowingly false and it harms someone, you are liable for that. Literally, you can be sued for that, and you can pay damages. Right? You, are, you are responsible for the consequences of what you are putting out there. But in fact, by giving a waiver to Section 230 in 1986, we explicitly said, if you are an online platform, Google or Facebook or Twitter or many other tools like that, you are in fact not responsible for what you put into the world. 
So if you're Google and you happen to share up something that is knowingly false and it damages and harms something, you cannot be sued for that. Right? Many of the issues we're now dealing with today weren't accidents, they were conscious decisions to say we want to remove any friction because the internet can be so transformative to people's lives, it can create so much wealth that we want to let it happen. This probably wasn't the wrong decision in 1986, but we are now, in 2019, starting to ask real serious questions as a society here in Canada, in America, around the world about those consequences, about the fact that maybe a lot of these things we've created are really not healthy for us as individuals. Maybe they're deeply damaging to our communities. And in fact, they may be taking down democracy, right? There are meaningful consequences to a lot of these things. And the crazy thing is, most of this are actually the technologies that are relatively less consequential to our lives than the kinds of new technologies that are coming focused on healthcare or focused on food or focused on um, education. And so those entrepreneurs, the ones that are building startups now in these much more complex regulated sectors, are not going to have the benefit of the doubt that the Facebooks of the world did uh, 10, 12 years ago. The final point, the final trend, is simply that stuff's ab about to get really freaky. Um, I see startups nowadays that are indistinguishable from the science fiction that I read as kids. You know, I have startups that are pitching me that are like, hey, so I am building like, um, you know, basically a probe that I stick into like a human brain and it creates a billion parallel connections uh, so we can like talk to a computer. I'm like, okay, what are you doing that for? Oh, well then like somebody can control like a robotic exoskeleton. So if they're a quadriplegic, they can lead a normal life by just walking around with the robotic exoskeleton. And I'm like, wasn't that like in Aliens or in Avatar or like central to the plot of the Matrix, the like, we're just gonna connect our brains directly up to computers. But this stuff is actually happening now, in the real world, around us every day. These technologies are coming to, to reality and fruition, right? We just had a, a, a startup come pitch us that said we're growing real live meat directly from meat cells in a laboratory that's never actually been an animal. And here's the ribeye and here's the sirloin steak. And I'm like, hmm, that's cool, that's also scary. Right? You have startups that are working on building new life forms using CRISPR technology with a home computer. You can literally now edit the human genome or the frog genome um, like you can any other source code. And you can then go print out <laughs> the results of that, which is life. Wasn't that kind of the, the plot of Jurassic Park? And that didn't necessarily end well. Uh, you're looking at drones. You're looking at cars that drive themselves. When my wife and I uh, got our new Tesla Model 3 and we unpacked it just before Christmas. We were so excited and we got into it. And like on the second day, we turned on autopilot. And like, no kidding, the car drove itself. Like, I don't have to touch the steering wheel, I don't have to touch the pedals, I just punch in the address and the car just starts driving itself and it goes on and off the highway and it switches lanes. And it goes, oh, there's traffic up ahead, do you want me to go around it? Does all that stuff. Mind-blowingly cool. And yet, it took about two weeks before my wife and I went, this is incredible, but there is no way this should be actually allowed and legal on streets. Because it's incredibly cool 99.99% .99 of the time, but boy, is that one in 10,000 shot a doozy. Um, the consequences of these new technologies that are starting to become real in our lives are so much greater in terms of the potential impact, but also the potential damage and risk they represent. It is very hard to imagine that we're going to roll out brain probes that connect you directly up to the internet without an awful lot of regulation around it. At least I hope we're not going to roll out brain probes that connect you up to the internet without an awful lot of regulation around it. So what does this mean? Well, one of the things that it means is that what matters and what networks and relationships you have access to is shifting. So this is a picture of the battery in San Francisco. And if an inspired young entrepreneur wants to go raise venture capital in Silicon Valley, at some point, if they're successful at it, they're going to have to go meet a VC at this private club smack on Battery Street in San Francisco. And you can walk in and it's like, um, you know, a who's who of all the crazy, amazing venture capitalists that you see tweeting out pithy advice about how you build companies online. 
And the people who sit around at the battery um, sharing tips with each other and making introductions to different startups actually have an unbelievable amount of control in this era we've come through the past 20 years on who gets funded and how they get funded and who the winners are and how capital gets allocated. Billions and billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars now can get allocated remarkably quickly based on what a relatively small number of people sitting in this club think about things. And this idea has now become uh, enshrined in a book that Reid Hoffman, one of the founders of LinkedIn and a, a major venture capitalist wrote called Blitzscaling. And the premise is more or less the, the entrepreneur that raises the most capital first is probably going to win simply because they can blitz out all their competition. And that, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? It's, it's kind of nuts, but it, it makes sense. It's, it's been very much the religion of Silicon Valley that's sort of driven this era. But as we move into the regulatory era and the kinds of startups that we're building and how we're building them are changing, right? boring old city hall suddenly is becoming relevant again. So you guys don't have them here in Waterloo or even in Toronto, right? But um, have any of you guys visited cities recently that have, have the scooters, the little electronic scooters? Do you have them here? Okay. So like <clears throat> where I'm from in Washington, D.C., we have these bugs called cicadas that come every seven years. And they always come like right about the point at which you forgot they were a thing. And then all of a sudden, for one summer, you just completely covered in bugs everywhere. And they make a god-awful racket, and they all die, and there's rotting bugs covering everything. That's what it felt like when all of a sudden the scooters arrived in Washington, D.C. And it was like, one day there weren't scooters, and then one day there were thousands and thousands of little tiny scooters everywhere. And they were just like the bugs. They would like die and run out of batteries, and they'd be like floating along in the river, and they'd be sitting there on the Lincoln Memorial. And it was both incredibly cool, right? So like on one of the first weeks that they were there, I was like late for a meeting and I was like, I'm actually gonna try one of these scooters. And it was like a spring day and I'm like zipping along through traffic on the scooter with my wind in my hair. And I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Like this is totally the future of transportation. And like the world is an amazing place. And like a week after that, I'm walking down the sidewalk and I have my 18 month old son and my little baby carrying thing. And I'm holding my three year old daughter's hand and some jackass 25 year old on a scooter goes zipping down the sidewalk and like my first instinct was to like shoulder check him into the road and my second instinct was like they need to ban these things these are dangerous they should not be on our streets they should be regulated into oblivion what is going on in this world both are true they are incredibly interesting, and they do uh, provide last mile transportation at radically less cost. So they do enable interesting multimodal transportation networks. All of that's true. And they sure as hell should be regulated. There need to be rules about these things. You shouldn't be able to put little tiny missiles going at 15 miles per hour just anywhere on a sidewalk, and make, maybe they should wear helmets, and there's a whole bunch of things. They become really, really obvious. And so they, they launched all these scooters, and it probably only took like a month or two. And literally, these companies did not exist, none of them, 18 months ago. And most of the big ones have now raised billions and billions of dollars, like that. Classic Silicon Valley blitz scaling. But it took like a month before San Francisco said, yo, 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 not gonna happen. These things are banned until we actually figure out the rules and what we wanna happen and how they're gonna work. In Washington, D.C., where I'm from, they said, okay, a given scooter company can only launch 400 of them and you have to share all your data with us so that we can actually assess and measure where they're going and how they're, how they're happening, what's happening, so that we can put official rules in place. And Silicon Valley, I mean, the greatest injustice to ever happen to the world was befallen when cities banned these scooters. How could you? Why do you hate innovation? Why are you opposed to progress? Do you not want to save the planet? And it had really no effect because actually most citizens and most cities kind of agreed with the basic premise that these are interesting, but we need to actually have rules about them and we need to study them. Right? You didn't see some giant citizen uprising rising, voting out their city councils because they stopped scooters. And now, in most of those cities, you're now having the scooters actually kind of get deployed and you're starting to have real rules around them and you're starting to have consequences if your scooter gets left on the Lincoln Memorial and, and all these things. Right? As we start to focus more innovation, in these areas in which we as citizens do expect government to play an important role, like scooters, 
um, the amount of capital you raise actually is becoming less important in comparison to your ability to actually reach out and collaborate and work with boring old City Hall. Um, if you're building startups, right, and you really want to understand how to do it in the regulated era, you should probably go out and read my book. It's on Amazon, it's easy to get. Um, but I'll, I'll share some, some important principles. Um, the first one is that even in this regulated era, as a regulatory hacker, experimentation is still um, what wins. Right, so most of these incredible companies that have operated in our, uh, over the last 20 years that have changed our lives as consumers, right, the methodology and the ethos has been what's called the lean startup methodology. To summarize that as simply as possible, it says, uh, to win, you should be a scientist and not an engineer. Right? Most founders incorrectly start out by going, I know exactly what kind of amazing product I'm going to build, and I'm going to create a blueprint for it and a project plan to get there, and as soon as I build this startup, Customers will be overjoyed and will flock to come buy my product. Seems really right. Unfortunately, almost every entrepreneur that follows that uh, approach uh, fails miserably because they're not just a little bit wrong about who their customer is and what they really want and what they need and what the product looks like and the business model. They're like wildly wrong. And by the time they figure that out, they've spent all their capital and wasted years of their lives and they fail. And that in fact, you're much better off being like a scientist and forming hypotheses and testing them and learning and iterating and experimenting to actually understand your customer, their problem, your product, how you get there. Well, experimentation is still just as important in the regula regulated era. It's actually even more important because the number of variables you have to solve for is greater. You don't just need to understand your customer and their problem. You don't just need to understand how to solve it. You also are going to have to test and understand uh, the kinds of people you're going to have to work with, the rules that are in place, how to shape those rules, how to change those rules in order to actually create a viable business. The difference is you're not just focused on your customer in a narrow sense, and you're not just focused on how to solve their problem. You're focused on a much broader set of issues, which is your power map. One of our startups uh, at 1776 is called Baby Scripts. And they uh, create a, a set of devices and an app that allows an expectant mom to track her pregnancy in real time. So she has a little wireless scale and a wireless blood pressure cuff and a wireless home ultrasound thing, and they all talk to an app. And it tracks all the data every day, um, and it can tell the expectant mom if there's any signals that would indicate a high-risk condition that they should be worried about. So when they started, they said, this is going to be awesome. We're going to give this to expectant moms. What they figured out really quickly is that actually expectant moms get really freaked out if there's an app saying you may have a high-risk condition and their doctor is not involved in the process. So they went, oh, that's cool. We'll just go to OBGYNs, and then they can also be involved in this thing. It'll be cool because it'll connect you up to your doctor. And it turns out, actually, OBGYNs don't use a tool like that, the nurses use a tool like that. And the nurses come to the doctor and say, there's some data that's telling us something that you should look at at doctor. Great, so we'll sell the doctors and the nurses. Oh, except most OBGYN practices in the US are now owned by massive health systems that have like thousands of OBGYN practices. So now I have to go talk to the administrator in charge of maternal health inside a large health system and figure out what problem they face, which is really one of like cost reduction and risk management, and how to make sure they're on board with this. Except, part of what they care about is in insurance reimbursements, which means I now need to go to the insurance company or Medicaid or whoever it is that's paying for this and actually figure out what they care about. And probably there's a regulator out there somewhere who's gonna be concerned about this data that, this private health data that's just now flowing around the internet. And oh, by the way, every OBGYN practice in the US has to conform to standards that are written by the American College of Gynecology. So if I can't get the American College of Gynecology to sign off on this, literally no doctor is allowed to use it. So, who's your customer? Right? You actually have to understand your entire power map, and you have to understand who influences them, what they care about, what they fear, their risks, the rules that they control or that they are subject to, in order to really get much of anything done. And so in the era of the consumer, we could be unbelievably obsessive about our customer, and that sounds and feels really right. In the regulatory hacking era, that often leads you down a blind path. You actually have to take a step back, widen your aperture, and understand your full power map if you're going to find the regulatory hacks that will lead you to success. Another key point or principle if you're building things, um, data matters. There should be a much higher burden of proof for a lot of these new technologies that are coming to bear. You want to put a, a 3,000 pound car on the road and let it drive itself, you better have an incredible amount of data that in fact shows that it is safer than a human driver. You want to stick a probe in someone's brain and let them control a robotic exoskeleton, 
I'm really hoping there's going to be an awful lot of data. But even in a more mundane sense, right? if you want to go and change the way that teachers educate my kids, I want to see real data that says this is in fact improving education outcomes and doesn't just seem cool. And so if you're an entrepreneur and you're operating this space, you shouldn't resent this fact, you should plan for it and you should prepare for it and you should think about how you're going to acquire that data and how you're going to form that proof so that uh, you can be comfortable expanding to a broad market. Um, it's not hard if we think about sitting here 20 years from today and looking back and going, what have been the biggest venture-backed exits um, of the past 20 years? Some of the companies you probably already know about, right? It's, it's actually Uber just went public. Um, and hey, I just checked, and now they're not the worst IPO in history. They're like the third worst IPO in history, but they still are worth like $65 billion. So they're still a big venture-backed exit. Airbnb, Coinbase, Robinhood. But I'm willing to wager all that white space <clears throat> is going to be filled in by an awful lot of startups that um, make these companies here look a lot more like the Facebooks and the Google of the world than where the really, really big winners are going to be. And they're ones that are going to be tackling really, really hard, complex problems with really interesting science in ways that can genuinely and deeply transform our lives. One other thing that is worth noting, while all of this is happening, we're focusing on what entrepreneurs need to do differently and investors need to do differently, we also need to think about how do we actually regulate these things? Right? I've, I sort of come across at times like I'm someone who loves regulation, when in fact, a lot of regulation is worthless and red tape and gets in the way of things. A lot of regulation is vital, but across all of that, it often feels like we still create regulation through our governments <clears throat> as a society and about the the same way we maybe wrote software in the 1970s, right? IBM punch card, waterfall methodology level of software writing, not super agile data-driven ways of doing it. And so one of the big questions that I'm, I'm grappling with now is if you were an amazing forward-thinking uh, policymaker today, how would you actually write regulation in a way that is adaptive and agile, that unlocks this innovation, but directs it in a way that actually uh, ensures that these technologies work in the public interest? And getting these things right. How we build startups, how we fund startups, how we think about policy and regulation is incredibly important to make sure that my kids and their kids and all of your kids and your grandkids like, grow up in this future, like the one that sort of feels like it comes maybe from Star Trek where we get to fly around super cool spaceships uh, establishing peace and justice in the galaxy and there's like little replicators on our ship and we press a button and healthy food automatically arrives and it all feels kind of good um, and not this future. And I often feel like we kind of are at this interesting inflection point where either future is actually an awful lot closer than we might think and more likely than we might like to think. <clears throat> and as a society, as entrepreneurs, as investors, as policymakers, as citizens, we have real choices to make to ensure that we stay on the right path and uh, we don't fall into the wrong path. With that, I think I'm way over time and I apologize, but we have some Q&A to do. Um, so thank you very much. No, th thank you for that, uh, Evan. That was a really, really uh, very cool set of remarks. I mean, honestly, you're, you're a gifted public speaker, um, and you're talking about really interesting stuff. And while you were talking, I was left with two thoughts. Um, one was, how do I get my exoskeleton? But <laughs> perhaps, uh, no, perhaps more pointedly, I mean, you, you talked about CRISPR technology and modifying DNA and self-driving cars. And you know, all these areas where there is, the government is going to have to step in, it's just too damn important. But the problem is, is that I was kind of feeling a bit of a tension in your remarks because on the one hand, the startup culture and the innovation culture is to run fast and break stuff. And no one has ever, ever accused lawyers and regulators of moving too fast on anything. So there's this inherent tension. How do you see that playing out as this goes forward? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, again, we have come through a particular period in time where wisely or not, as a society, we sort of decided that these were decisions that should be made almost exclusively by entrepreneurs and investors who were going to run fast and break things. I think, as a society, we're reassessing some of that. Um, and I think that's good and healthy, because I actually think the right answer, as we get into these more impactful, and more consequential technologies is collaboration. I, I don't actually want my government policymakers to be crazy risk takers. I, I want my government policymakers to be really thoughtful people about 
<clears throat> making sure that the values that we as a community choose to express democratically are actually protected and enforced. I want them to be good and thoughtful stewards of taxpayer money. Right? I want them to be somewhat measured in how they approach things. I don't want my entrepreneurs to be people who are going, well, golly gee, that might fail, so I'm just going to hold back and not pursue it. Right? The best outcomes are actually going to come through the interplay of that, through the tension of that. Um, but what's not happening right now today, in nearly enough cases, is, is active collaboration. Um, we had this amazing example for those of us that went and visited the uh, deputy minister for red tape production here in Ontario on, is it just yesterday? Jesus. Um, it's been a long trip. Um, it was amazing because he was like, um, this is all great. Like, we really, really want to talk to entrepreneurs. We're trying to talk to startups all the time. We're like literally hiring advertising saying, startups, we want to talk to you. And none of them will come talk to us. We want to figure out how to create regulation that's better. And he's like, so how do I solve that problem? And I said, you're not going to believe this, but the number one question I get when I'm done talking to an audience of entrepreneurs is they all raise their hand and they're like, yo, can I actually like talk to government? Like, is that a thing? Like, I, I didn't realize you could just go talk to government. And they're blown away by that idea. And so you have this, this weird chasm and disconnect of cultures. They're not speaking the same language. They don't feel comfortable in each other. They don't dress the same. They don't hang out in the same places. Um, but we're not going to solve these big, giant problems. We're not going to make sure all of this comes together in a way that leads us to the Star Trek future and not the Mad Max future unless we figure out how to bring that together. And a lot of what I've, I'm trying to do with the book is first address the startup side of that, but the government side is just as real. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of my hope, at least, for how we get these things addressed. And that actually made me think um, about the, the culture of experimentation. Like, I, I got the sense, you know, science, being scientific about experimentation and testing hypotheses. I wonder if there's not a place for uh, regulatory experimentation and that kind of, what they call that regulatory sandbox. Do you have any thoughts on, on kind yeah, of Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of places are doing fun things with sandboxes. Um, but I, I feel like that's an an interim step. It's almost acknowledging really the broad way we do regulation is broken, so let's create a special place where we can be faster and more agile. Uh, my next trip after this, I'm actually flying out tomorrow night to, to Estonia for a conference and to work with the team uh, in Estonia that's leading their policy hacks team. Um, and they're doing crazy things. I mean, it's a small city state, so they have, it's easier to do these kinds of things. But like one of the big concepts they're working on is what they call algorithmic regulation. So the idea is to actually focus on the objective variable that you care about, which is maybe in the case of scooters, uh, the incidence of accidents. And to essentially write the regulation to say, we don't really care what the maximum speed of a scooter is. What we care about is how many accidents there are. And so, you know what, as we actually get real world data that comes in that tells us what the accident rate is, if the accident rate is sufficiently low, like we're fine with the spe maximum speed of the scooters going up. But if the accident rate is going up too high, we need to bring that maximum speed back down, right? And, and to write the laws and write the regulations in a way that is fundamentally empirical, right? That is, that is actually looking at what's working in real time and adapting and adjusting in real time. That's a, a radical shift, radical shift in how policymakers think about these things. And I think it's, it's places like Estonia that are probably going to experiment first and sort of show us some interesting models. And it'll take 20 years to fully permeate. out. But that's, that's a lot of the kind of stuff I've been looking at. So you're saying evidence-based policymaking. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's not get crazy well, here, right? Like not just evidence-based, but like, maybe I'm revealing my own biases, but like, to me, regulation is just software code. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the software code that we write that defines how we want our societies to operate. And in a lot of cases, it's literally code. Like, it's the term we use, go open the federal code of the United States of America, and it looks just like line after line of software code. The difference is it's just really bad software code written in a really, really old way. Um, that doesn't have to be the case, and there's, I think, vastly more creative ways. And so if, if I ever get around to writing a second book, I think I'm going to call it the social code. Like, literally, how do we better write this code that actually helps provide the guardrails and the guidelines for how we want our societies to operate. That's a fair point, and I'm I'm a lawyer, so I've read my fair share of legislation, and it is very buggy software <laughs> for sure. It is. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions. If anyone in the audience has questions, feel free just to put your hand up, introduce yourself, and I'll I'll call on you to ask a question if you have one. Um, uh, and while we're waiting for the audience to get warmed up here, um, 
you mentioned this idea about kind of uh, getting the, getting to the market first, getting the VC funding, and basically squeezing out uh, squeezing out your mm -hmm. competitors. So rushing to being the first in the marketplace. And so I stacked that on top of your comments about the fact that we're looking at companies that are now entering the deeply public space. It's not just about yep. getting your clothes washed and dating apps and, and food delivery services anymore, but this is real stuff. And so with that phenomenon of rushing the market fast, getting the VC, squeezing your competitors out, um, do you see kind of these companies being partially to blame for what whatever unfolds in that space that that ha is part of that buggy software or, or glitches in their system or things that don't work properly and and on top of that is there a role for regulatory agencies in that space yeah, absolutely like I, I don't think I actually don't think when we look back on it right Facebook's nemesis isn't going to have come because of their original sin, which was, hey, we don't care about your privacy in relation to connecting you up with your family and friends and enabling you to stalk your high school girlfriend. That actually wasn't it. Maybe good, maybe bad, but the consequences were more limited. The, the, the nemesis will come because of the, the next more aggressive sin, which was when they decided they didn't just want to help you connect up with what was happening in your social life and your family life, that they they wanted to be your primary source for the consumption of news. And the data now says, uh, unbelievable percentages, 80, 85% of all news consumption is now being driven by Facebook's algorithm. Mark Zuckerberg is the editor for two billion people's news consumption. And that's really recent. It's only been in the last three years that Facebook made a conscious decision that there was really, really juicy stuff to be gained by disintermediating media. The news media has a different role in our society. It has a more important and higher status role. And in the end, what you're going to look back on is that it's when Facebook decided to overreach into not just <laughs> telling us what our family and friends were doing, but telling us what was happening in the world and what we should think about it, that, that their downfall was sort of written. And I think it's, I don't know the form that it'll take, and I don't know exactly how long it'll take, and I don't know who will drive it, but I think it's almost inevitable that Facebook in its current form is not not sustainable as a business. I couldn't agree more. And um, and in fact, uh, we had the Minister of Democratic Institutions here, Karina Gold, about two weeks ago, and we were having a conversation about uh, foreign interference, election integrity, and platform governance. And you want to talk about regulation. Regulation is coming. And I know Zuckerberg's playing a big game, uh, you know, where he writes that op-ed saying, we definitely want to be regulated. It's funny that he didn't mention tax regulation, didn't mention all the, the, the bits that actually need to happen in order to make the system work. Whether you call it blitzscaling, or, or Peter Thiel wrote a book a few years before that called Zero to One. The fascinating thing is the, the sort of, it's, it's so obvious it's right in front of you that it's almost easy to miss it at times, but like the very, very explicit strategy that Silicon Valley has pursued, and, and not just Silicon Valley, but sort of the Silicon Valley culture globally, is, is explicit. It's, it's in Peter Thiel's book, it's in Reid Hoffman's book, which is if any strategy other than creating a monopolist and then extracting maximum rents is economically foolish. That's the only thing that you should do. Mm -hmm. Fascinating part of that is that goes against a vast amount of existing laws and a vast amount of tradition in America, in Canada, in Europe that says actually massive rent-seeking monopolies are, if not inherently bad, at least highly suspect. I think the, the problem is, right, n the way in which those rules were written for the steel industry, it's very hard to cognitively think about them and apply them to what that means to something like Facebook. Mm -hmm. How do you regulate Facebook? How do you break Facebook up? What does that really mean? Because you could say, well, hive off Instagram and hive off WhatsApp and leave Facebook behind, but there's a bunch of natural reasons why many of us want <laughs> a single place that we can all go. There's, there's such overwhelmingly network effects that even if you did that, it's most likely that another monopoly would form very quickly, and how do you deal with that? And I think that's a lot of the questions um, that people are, are grappling with right now. In the same way that, you know, we all, our forefathers and foremothers gathered, grappled with exactly these same questions in the early progressive era, in the, you know, 1906 to 1920, right? Like, how do we actually regulate these massive new trusts that have formed and emerged that don't necessarily feel like they're good for society? Mm -hmm. No, that's a, so I'm looking if there's questions, but we have one over here. Please, yes. Hi, good evening. My name is Kathy. First time at CGI, CIGI and happy to be here. 
I am a little off topic, but I listened to you driving your first Tesla. And about a year ago on the business channel, which I listen to every day, I heard of a startup company, which I'm wondering if you have anything to do with, of a two-seater flying car out of San Francisco that they're using from mm -hmm. downtown San Francisco to the airport. And I sure would like one eventually. <laughs> <laughs> So are you dealing with these people? I, I, I have not personally invested in any flying car startups, but I'm familiar with a, an awful lot of them. And yeah, like that's a real thing. And they're being tested in real world environments now. And uh, if you look at the prospectus for Uber, which just went public, like they list flying cars as a vertical that they're actively investing into right now because they want you to eventually call your flying taxi through the Uber app. Um, and they're not crazy. But again, like, huh, if we thought regulating Uber the first time was tricky, <laughs> just wait till they're flying through our skies, right? Um, and again, like pretty obvious to see where the potential downsides and risks are in that. We've got a question over here. So you've talked a lot about how, uh, you've talked a lot about how industry has to think about this, but I'm curious if you have thoughts about how government will mm -hmm. evolve. Uh, will it always be, do you think it'll always be reactive? Like, well, we didn't think of that, and now we have to regulate around it, or, or like, how do you see that moving forward? First, um, I, I have incredibly deep empathy for startup founders, and in fact, for investors, and, and like, we were talking about this, I think, over dinner before this event, and like most startup founders lead horrible lives. As, as much as we like to sort of romanticize it, and to, we've been in a period of time in which it's very sexy to sort of be working in a startup, like actually most founders that I know um, deal with unbelievable insecurity and massive amounts of stress every single day, and the vast majority of them will, will never succeed. Um, I, I think it's awesome that these people are willing to sort of put so much in and take so much risk to try to actually make the world a better place. Um, as eye-rolling as that sometimes can feel when they get up and announce that their um, dating app is going to change the world. But the, um, and I have just as much empathy, actually, for most policymakers and regulators. Um, and again, coming back to this issue of, um, like, almost every governmental form in the world, you distill down democracy or monarchy or whatever, like when you actually look at the people who are in these agencies and trying to make these decisions, almost all of them face hugely asymmetric incentives. So let's imagine a policymaker who goes, hey, uh, there's this cr cool new startup that has this amazing thing. They have flying two-seater taxis. Um, you know what? The potential rewards are so huge, I'm just going to let them do it. And in fact, like, I'm going to give some subsidies and incentives to help them do it. And uh, it succeeds. It works. And flying taxi company transforms the way people get around cities, and it's amazing, and it's better for the environment, or whatever it is, and that's awesome. What's the reward for that policymaker? I might use US terms, but like, great, they go from being a GS-13 to a GS-14, and nobody ever knows who they are. Like, that happens over and over and over again in these scenarios. Now, let's think about the inverse. The exact same policymaker who goes, cool, I'm going to let your flying taxis run rampant in our cities, and I'm going to actually give money to help make that happen. And uh, two months into the pilot, a flying taxi falls from the sky and kills a family, and all the money is lost. Like, we all know exactly what would happen to that public official. Right? They would be absolutely filleted. They wouldn't just lose their jobs. They would be humiliated and destroyed publicly. They would be put up as a villain. They would be taken before hearings, and they would be forced to give testimony. And the, the questions those senators or whoever is asking wouldn't be, hey, we know we wanted you to be a bit more risk-taking in how you thought about policy. Do you feel like you made the right choice? They would be, how could you do this to this family? How could you do this to society? How could you waste taxpayer money, right? And that's, that's not wrong. Like, again, we don't want our governments I don't think, to be out there taking, generically at least, and not in exceptional circumstances, crazy, crazy risks. We want them to be good stewards of these issues. The, the challenge, though, is in, in how they go about that and where they get information from and how they go about writing these rules and, and how these things happen. And so um, the idea of regulatory hacking is not new at all. Like a lot of my friends in DC always joke, congratulations, Evan, you wrote Public Affairs 101 for startups. 
right? Big corporations have been doing every single technique that's in the book since time immemorial to appropriately influence government to write the rules in a way that favors them. It's something that is, again, so obviously in front of us that we often don't see it. So that actually makes me think, right? So it, very quickly, my mind turns to the public interest, right? When we talk about flying mm -hmm. cars or healthcare or genetic technology, that is very much in the public interest. And we're talking about private companies in the public interest. And so I guess my question to you then becomes, you know, with these with startups entering the market, do they have any requirement to think about what's in the public's best interest or can they do whatever they want and then we have to wait for the regulators to catch up? So look, I have a... Probably two very different answers to that because it's a question like what is the ethical responsibility of a, of a startup or a company in general? Like, I have, on the one hand, I have a really tough time. Like, my sister was visiting the other day and, and she yelled at me for um, uh, our Amazon order arrived and she yelled at me for using Amazon because Amazon destroys small businesses. And I was like, I'm using Amazon because it's radically more convenient and it's less, less cost effective and I can get the selection that I want. And like, yeah, I care about small businesses, but is it really Amazon's responsibility to intentionally not be more convenient and cheaper and faster so that they don't kill small businesses? Like, I have a really tough time with that. Like, if, if we care about small businesses that much, like as a society, democratically, we should write rules to protect those small businesses if that's something we really care about. But we shouldn't tell Amazon to be less good so that they don't outcompete those small businesses. That feels wrong. In the other direction, back to the Facebook example, to me it was entirely predictable what happened to Facebook when they decided to disintermediate media. Then it was catastrophically dumb because they were not taking due care, they weren't operating the public interest, they weren't thinking that through. And from a, from a pure business decision, uh, it was overreach and it's gonna come bite them in the ass. Um, and we had, a, we had a founder at a roundtable we did at DMZ in Toronto yesterday. And he was saying, you know, GDPR, which is the new privacy laws in Europe, are still sort of unsettled. They haven't really been litigated. People don't really know how they apply. There's no privacy laws yet in the US, and the Canadian laws are this. And like, as a founder, like, I don't know how I should build my solution in this uncertain regulatory environment. What's your advice? And I was like, look, I don't think that's really that hard. Like, step one. Don't build your, your, your online product in a way in which you would be embarrassed to tell your users exactly what you're doing with their data. If you can be fully transparent and fully open with your users about what you're doing with your data and how, you're probably gonna be okay, regardless of how the regulatory regime shakes out. If on the other hand, you feel like you have to write your terms of service in such little tiny print and make it so long that no one could possibly actually understand the consequences of clicking accept, you're probably doing something that's pretty crappy. So don't be crappy, be good, and you're probably gonna be okay how a regulation turns out. That's usually my advice for founders is, it's very rarely a bad business decision to make sure you're operating broadly in the public interest. And it may take 10 years, and maybe you've made yourself billions of dollars in the process, but if you're operating outside the public interest too consistently for too long, it will eventually get you. Um, are there companies that are doing it right? Because we always, I mean, we all, to be fair, we always hear the bad stories. We hear the Cambridge Analytica's and the, you know, the so, hacks and the breaches. So let me and give, any, have, any, have any of you guys used or bought for a family member or anything 23andMe? The sort of home genetic testing startup? Um, yeah, so like they would be a great example. Um, you know, when they first launched, they, uh, you literally, spit in the little tube and you send it into them and they do a, a full a genomics test on you. <clears throat> and when they first launched, they would like send you back a report and say, based on all of our data, um, here's your ancestral history and here's traits we think you're likely to have and by the way, you're probably gonna die of cancer uh, pretty soon. Or whatever it was, right? Like, and um, they uh, very famously got a, uh, finally, a cease and desist letter from the FDA. Um, and this was actually like the fifth letter. So they got like a first letter that said, hmm, seems like you're offering unregulated medical advice. We'd like to consult with you. And then they didn't respond and they got a second letter and a third letter. And finally they got a fourth letter that said, if you continue doing this tomorrow, uh, you will be shut down and you will go to jail. And they stopped. And this was again, very much in Silicon Valley, the rhetoric of this is unbelievably great breach of justice and how could we shut this down and why do people hate innovation and medicine and all that? 
The interesting part was that they actually took a step back and they said, cool, well, we are allowed to just continue the ancestral testing, and that was sort of what kept them alive. And, and they adjusted and they adapted and they learned to collaborate with the FDA and they learned to share data and share information and, and how to apply our high level rigor. And I think it was last year that they were able to start rolling out the first very specific um, online cancer test where they could say, do you have a higher propensity for this form of breast cancer? And now I think there's about 15 or 20 and I'm, I've used 23 and me and like every week or two, like they roll out a new test that says, hey, we've already got your DNA sample so we can now tell you with rigor, with data behind it, uh, in a way that has gone through scrutiny and peer review, what your odds are of getting this particular different type of condition and whether you should go talk to your doctor about this. That to me is a good example of a company that sort of took the, took the Silicon Valley approach, got their asses kicked, took a step back, and I think is pursuing a much more sustainable and much better result for society because they've sort of learned how to collaborate and how to do this in a, in a better way. That's uh, no. That's a really insightful way of of um, kind of making that point. Is with a company like that. Um, so we've got one question here. Oh, please, yeah, go ahead. So when you're working with the FDA or with governments, how do you prevent it so that the governments will minimize their risk by never getting fired because they choose IBM on the one hand? Or on the other hand, the the companies with the most money or the most lobbying power just get the regulations changed to squash out the young upstart competitors. You know, I I often feel like um, depending on the audience, depending on the talk, like sometimes. Uh, I finish and the audience feels like I sound like some sort of crazed and randy and libertarian. Um, and half the time I finish and I feel like the audience thinks I'm uh, some sort of like, you know, socialist who wants to impose structure and order on all of government. And that's, I think, broadly because I actually think the best answers do come from collaboration and balance. But um, look, regulatory capture and rent seeking is very real. There was no strategy Uber was going to deploy in the early days other than the one that they did. There was no amount of going and asking for permission and seeking to collaborate that was going to cause fully captured local taxi cab commissions to decide to let Uber operate. It's never going to happen. Uber had to pursue a beg forgiveness strategy in which they largely went in, operated, took the hit on fines and impoundment, had an amazing product that got consumers addicted incredibly quickly, and then use those consumers as a, as a citizen army to get city councils to change the rules, which is what happened over and over and over again. And Uber perfected that playbook and they scaled up incredibly quickly. They took it way, way too far and they continued to take a confrontational strategy long past the point at which they needed to. But sometimes you really do just have bad government and bad policy and bad outcomes in the same way that like there's really good and appropriate regulation that says things like, if you're going to offer online medical advice, you probably need to have gone through a rigorous peer-reviewed process and not just move fast and break things. There's also lots and lots of regulation that is red tape and is just dumb and old and antiquated and doesn't need to be there. Um, so I don't, I don't think you can sort of do a one-size-fits-all. And, and what I get often sort of tired of is, particularly in the startup world, this sort of eye-rolling that says, oh, all government's bad. And I'm like, you you must have enough intellectual rigor to know that any statement that starts with all blank is blank is probably a fallacy, right? Um, you know, I, I work really closely with the Department of Defense uh, in the US. Um, I literally live like a half mile from the Pentagon, so it's, it's convenient. And, um, you know, it would be hard to find a bigger and, and more challenging bureaucracy in the world. I, maybe the State Department, I don't mean to offend, but um, but like DOD is, when you think of a massive government reaction to that, and when you think of like big giant, nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM and uh, horrible procurement processes and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, like Department of Defense for a while now was operating in a very flat budgetary environment with an increasing number of threats and they wanted to be shifting more and more money over towards certain things and not spending on other things. And it was really fascinating to watch it because they were like, look, we really want to work with startups. We want to skip past the Lockheed Martins and the Booz Allens of the world and we want to go work with startups and we want to innovate and we don't know how to do it. And it was really funny because like, they were like, okay, we're going to roll out these, these exciting new procurement approaches and we'd introduce them to a startup and they'd go, cool, we have this new program and uh, you can help us do this thing so much faster and cheaper, it's crazy. And in only two and a half years, we can give you a $10 million contract. 
And the startup is looking at them like, uh, I'm probably going to be dead in two and a half years, and I don't even know what to do with a $10 million contract. Like, could you get me a $50,000 contract in three months? And can we start doing things? And DOD's like, like literally no. Like, we don't know how to give a $50,000 contract, and we can't do anything in three months. So, ah, roll forward another two years, three years. Like, now? Um, the Air Force has this super cool program, and they're now sitting there every three months on schedule, and they're letting all these startups that they want to work with apply for a program, and they're getting $50,000 grants, and then they can get more money, and it's actually happening really quickly, and they've cut out a bunch of their paperwork. Like, government can get better. The point is, the Department of Defense didn't just sit there and say, we want to work with startups, let's rip up all of our procurement rules and just start doing something else. They, they did it in a somewhat controlled and measured way. And I think that's right, and I don't think, I think that is what we would expect. Of our, of our government officials and policymakers is to try to do the right thing, but also try to do it in a way that is thoughtful about the consequences in a way that we don't necessarily need our startups to do or want our startups to do. I have a closing thought, but before I get to that, I wanted just to let the audience know about two uh, forthcoming events uh, here. So on May 23rd, um, we're going to have a panel discussion on the economics for a burning planet. So that second scenario with the truck and the guns, not the happy scenario, is the one Mad we're Max. talking about. The, yeah. the Mad Max scenario. Uh, so we'll be talking about the, uh, the, the effectively changing logic for a growth economy. Uh, several experts uh, and their distinct perspective on sustainable and equitable growth and what that can mean. And then on June 3rd, uh, we're going to have a lunchtime talk here with one of our fellows, uh, Bridget Ven Venzia on cultural appropriation in the fashion industry, which is actually pretty wild stuff. You should see what's going on. And then we're going to talk about the intellectual property rules that apply or don't apply when people appropriate culture in the fashion industry. So coming to a, a close, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by something. You know, the, the, We started our conversation about this tension between government mm -hmm. uh, kind of not really knowing how to regulate tech and tech not really knowing how to have that interplay, that healthy interplay with government. I'm heartened by the fact that there's people like you that are working on it when you're bringing your expertise to bear. So I'd like you to thank. I'd like to thank you for joining us here today. I'd like you guys to to uh, join me in thanking our speaker, Evan Burfield. Thank you, Evan. Thank you for having me. Thank you.